speaker will be Dr. Jasper Tebow, and he's going to talk to us about sulfur response in corn. I, I think by now, many of us will not wonder why we are. We have to be talking about sulfur uh, in North Dakota. Many farmers have observed uh, commonly, actually, uh, sulfur deficiency, especially at the early stage of growth in corn. However, we are beginning to see a lot more widespread sulfur deficiency in wheat. Uh, this morning, I'm going to brief, briefly talk about sulfur deficiency in corn and wheat, and then allow Sylvia Zilai, uh, who is a research soil specialist here at the station, to talk about this trial that uh, she established. Sulfur deficiency has increased primarily because the amount of sulfur that is deposited in our soils from the atmosphere has declined. With the Clean, clean Air Act, with a cleaner atmosphere nowadays, with pure, more purified fertilizer and herbicide products, we are seeing less sulfur being applied to our soils. Now, these were very important sources of sulfur. In the past 15, 20 years ago, sulfur was not commonly talked about, even though there were sulfur deficiencies. Where do we find sulfur deficiency in our fields? Sulfur deficiency will be commonly found in areas, in low-lying areas, where you commonly have uh, standing water. You have low sulfur in soils of low organic matter content. When the organic matter content in soil is less than 3%, and for the most part, I would say 3.5% in years where we have cold temperatures, in cold springs, at 3% and 3.5% soil organic matter, your sulfur may not be made available because that sulfur has to be mineralized. It has to be converted from the organic form to the sulfate form, which is the inorganic form, before plants can use it. We have more widespread sulfur deficiencies in sandy soils. In very heavy, in heavy, in heavy soils, that soils that contain a lot of uh, clay, we are less likely to see sulfur deficiency. However, studies in Minnesota have shown that sulfur deficiency is possible even in heavy as well as light soil. In 2005, Dr. George Rehm of Minnesota show that sulfur deficiency can significantly increase corn yields in light soils as well as in heavy soils. What are your sources of sulfur? Sulfur can be applied in the form of ammonium sulfate, the granular form. It can be applied as a liquid, ammonium thiosulfate, potassium thiosulfate. That is usually applied in, uh, that may not be applied in furrow, that, which means that it's not applied with the seeds because it can hurt the seeds. Another form of sulfur is gyps gypsum. However, in North Dakota, gypsum is not commonly applied. Gypsum is mostly used in the south, in southern part of the, uh, of the U.S. <coughs> it's commonly used as an amendment and not a source of sulfur. This year, we have set up four sulfur studies. We have a corn wheat trial that we are conducting, as well as uh, canola. We are seeing very good response of canola and corn to sulfur application in the form of gypsum. Now, gypsum is your calcium sulfate. Now, there's a misconception. Your gypsum does not affect your pH in the soil. Gypsum is neutral. It does not affect your pH in the soil. In order for us to diagnose sulfur deficiency in our crops, uh, as you can see, it is usually expressed as a yellowing <clears throat> of the entire plant. No matter whether you are dealing with, uh, with uh, I'm sorry, you can confuse, it can easily be confused with nitrogen deficiency. But because sulfur is immobile in plants, what happens is it does not move from the older leaves to the younger leaves. Nitrogen is mobile, so it moves from the old leaves to the younger leaves. In order for us to analyze our samples, 
for sulfur deficiency, what we do is we recommend that when you go to the field, when you have four leaf, five leaf corn stage, uh, corn growth stage, you cut the plants half inches above the soil surface. Take about 15 plants, I'm um, sorry, about 30 plants from affected areas. Go to a healthy area, take samples, mm -hmm. leaf samples, uh, the entire corn samples at the four or five leaf stage, cut it at the base just about half an inch above the soil surface, send to the lab for analysis. Now your sulfur content in the tissue, your sulfur analysis, analysis will give you a certain percentage. If it is between 0 0.12 and 0 0.21%, it says that uh, studies have shown that you may not suffer from sulfur deficiency. However, one important aspect about sulfur analysis is that when you rely on the sulfur test to give you just the sulfur analysis, it may not give you an indication of whether sulfur is uh, deficient. So it's been recommended that you take nitrogen and sulfur analysis on your crop to determine this ratio of nitrogen to sulfur, and the ratio of nitrogen to sulfur, if it is more than 15%, in some cases, some say 17 to 20%, then you'll be having sulfur deficiency. When you get to the six leaf, eight, 10 leaf deficiency uh, symptoms uh, on your field, what we recommend is you take the most, the youngest fully colored leaf, which is this, it's completely colored, the youngest fully colored leaf, take the samples from the field and submit to the, uh, to the lab for analysis. Now, if your plants actually, if you are at the reproductive stage where you begin to seek tassel, uh, you want to take the youngest leaf or the lower, the lower leaf on the opposite side of your, of your cob, where uh, your, your cob is going to be produced. You remove, you cut, you pluck the leaf on the lower, upper side of, of, of your corn plant, those leaves actually will be analyzed uh, to determine if you are having sulfur deficiency. However, it is very, we recommend that when you have, when you suspect sulfur deficiency, apply about 12 to 15 pounds of sulfur. In the beginning of the season, 15 pounds of sulfur will not hurt you. It is true that farmers, have, some farmers have wondered if sulfur deficiency may give you the economic uh, rewards. In some cases, yes. In other years, sulfur deficiency, uh, sulfur application may not give you the reward because the amount of organic matter that you had, you started with, and the soil temperature, uh, the temperature and moisture were all adequate for your sulfur to be mineralized and made available. So, but we normally, uh, we are actually re recommending that you apply sulfur to your crop. In wheat, uh, we have a trial right there where a nitrogen study, we went to the borders, applied sulfur and, uh, to the border plot, and we saw a complete change from yellowing plants to dark green. We are going to take the yields from those plots and uh, to determine at the end of the season if the response that we saw was tra will be translated to final yields, and if that actually makes economic sense. Well, because of short of time, actually, I would uh, allow uh, Sylvia uh, to complete the rest of the discussion based on this con sulfur trial. Hello, my name is Sylvia Zilohi Chavez, and I'd just like to uh, speak a couple words about this trial in specific. Um, there are two uh, different types of treatment here. One of them is a tillage treatment, so every other strip here is either a no-till, like this one here, or a conventional and, till. And uh, we also have four different uh, levels of sulfur application. Zero, 15, 30, and 45. They are in consecutive order in the first rep and they are randomized in the subsequent reps. And uh, the reason for conducting this trial is because we were wondering whether uh, there would be an interaction effect between tillage and sulfur treatments, uh, namely that uh, corn would, uh, might respond differently to sulfur under different uh, tillage practices because uh, tillage can change infiltration and it would also change um, at least uh, early season organic matter breakdown. And I'm not talking about uh, long-term effects here because this particular field was uh, a no-till 
um, full planted wheat before this trial and uh, this is the second year of it being a no-till on the no-till plots and uh, the first year of it uh, being conventional on the conventional plots after it being a no-till on wheat so these are short-term effects right now but we were wondering whether uh, the changes in infiltration and the uh, early season uh, organic matter breakdown would actually uh, cause uh, a difference in sulfur availability on the two different tillage, uh, tillage uh, treatments. So what we've seen so far is uh, early in the season on the plots that didn't receive any sulfur, I've seen um, more of a, a manifestation of uh, sulfur deficiency on the no-till as it was expected than on the conventional till but um, what, is, what is contrary to this though is that uh, later on we measured the heights and we found that uh, the, the plots uh, with the no-till treatment uh, were um, had com consistently taller plants than the plots uh, with the conventional till and you can see that on uh, the first chart and that, that was a significant difference and it, it was consistent for all the sulfur treatments. I am not sure why at this point. We also found that we had the tallest plants at uh, 30 pounds per acre sulfur. Uh, it was not significant. And uh, another data that we have is that we took NDVI, which is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index for every plot, uh, which is the next best thing uh, to just looking at it and saying this one is greener or that one is greener. We use this uh, green seeker sensor. It basically emits uh, red and infrared light and from the ratio you get a number which uh, is an indication of uh, leaf greenness or vigor. Uh, right here is 0 0.8. It ranges between 0 and uh, 0 0.99. Um, the ground between being about 0 0.2. 0.16 for here and uh, the canopy like this about 0.8 and on that one we saw a bit of a trend for the no-till treatment so you can see the red bars going up until the 30 pounds and then dropping at 45 and not much of a response on the conventional and uh, these were also not significant but uh, I was initially expecting a better uh, response from the no-till plus just because more potential for leaching and the slower breakdown of organic matter which would not reduce the sulfur as fast as the conventional. But uh, right now we don't have anything definitive. I took uh, tissue samples from each plot, sent it for analysis for nitrogen and sulfur. We're going to look at those individually and the ratio of them. And we'll also take uh, yield at the end obviously and uh, I'll also take uh, soil samples from each plot at harvest, which will tell us more, a better story about what is going on here. I didn't talk about soil tests. Soil test is a very important aspect of our soil, soil for, uh, evolution in our field. Sulfur tests are very unreliable to predict crop response. That is why we talk a lot about tissue sampling. So it will be a very important practice that when you take your soil samples, analysis, <coughs> Make sure you also use uh, tissue samples when plants are growing to determine if you are actually having sulfur deficiency. I have, uh, I'm just wondering how much is caused the simple uh, uh, analysis of soil sample or the tissue sample? For nitrogen alone, it was like $9 a sample at Eggwise. I'm not sure about nitrogen and sulfur together. It's probably not a whole lot more. Yeah, actually, when you start getting into sulfur, uh, you are looking at a situation where you may have to analyze for other elements. So it may go up to $16, $16 or as high as $29. It depends on what actually you have to analyze for. For nitrate, if you're just going for nitrogen only, nitrate only, it may cost you for $9. And it depends on the lab that you're sending your samples to. And plant samples are a little more expensive than soil. I don't have a price list but, uh, on me, but if you're interested, I have one in my office. Have you been seeing any difference between uh, using the dry uh, ammonium sulfate versus the liquid? Uh, any 
difference the availability in the spring when it's cold? Is one form more readily available? Yeah, good question. Actually, we have not conducted that study, but based on what I have read so far, uh, my general conclusion is that there's no difference between the infloral or liquid application versus the uh, granular application. And one other thing is the study, a study, a con study that we have right now that we applied gypsum. Uh, we applied gypsum, uh, applied ammonium sulfate, and we applied another product which is called polyhalite. It has potassium, magnesium, sulfur, and uh, we are looking at uh, calcium. We are actually seeing strong response to all these products. Uh, all, they are all granular products. So maybe next year actually we, will be, we might be looking into uh, liquid application to compare with granular. Oh, it's all for something like nitrogen that leaches into with a lot of rains in. So you put it on in the fall and you got a lot of rain in the spring. Is that can that leach down below the? You know the roots, uh, or, you know, for, so that the plant isn't uptaking it early in the season. Yes, uh, very good question. It can actually, uh, but what happens is because of time management, some producers prefer to apply some of that sulfur in fall. It is true that you may lose some of that sulfur, um, so, so some of your nitrogen. It is encouraged that when you are applying a nitrogen in fall, you apply it much later than in October, so that when temperatures or soil temperatures are cool. And the tendency for sulfur or the uh, likelihood that you may lose some of your nitrogen or your sulfur or any mobile nutrient like chlorine uh, will be much less. So depending on the, uh, the application, uh, depending on what product you use, you may use ammonium sulfate which is more readily uh, very soluble relative to a product like sulfur. Straight sulfur will not be easily broken down, but for ammonium sulfate, uh, compared to a product like gypsum, Ammonium sulfate, you have a higher probability of losing your, your nitrogen from ammonium sulfate than from uh, a less uh, solubilized uh, uh, granular, uh, granular fertilizer. Some use uh, urea ammonium nitrate, and they have seen very good response when they apply in fall uh, versus spring.